Return to Part 1. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a parent and a teacher. First, you have some time to go through questions 1 to 6. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good evening, Mr. Jameson. Please sit down. Uh, good evening. Uh, now, about my son Stephen's report. Yes, just a minute. Yes, now, what class is he in? Oh, yes, 4E. No, 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 4A, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Has he improved this year, Mrs. Hargreaves? Yes, I think overall, yes. Mind you, there is still room for more improvement in some subjects. Let's see. Maths. Well, the major problem here seems to be his algebra. Apart from that, he's doing much better. Could you help him with this, Mr. Jameson? Well, to be honest, it wasn't really my best subject at school either. But the overall exam result was encouraging. 60%. Yes, and history, I seem to remember a bad report for this last year. Well, he lacks concentration in the class, and of course this makes it difficult to remember things like dates and names, and a memory is quite useful in a subject like this. Oh dear. Well, I'll have a word with him when I get home and see what we can do to improve that. And music. Music, yes. Is he still having guitar lessons? Yes, every Monday after school. His music teacher has commented that he doesn't seem to be taking them very seriously. I think it was just a craze he had, Mrs Hargreaves. I've noticed that he hasn't been very interested in practising at home. And also, he tends to talk a lot in class. I mean, he's very talkative. And he only got 40% in the exam. Well, nobody in our family is very musical, so I don't expect him to do very well. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through questions 7 to 10. Now listen carefully and answer questions 7 to 10. Looking at his geography result, though, there has been considerable improvement, 64%. Yes, I remember him working at home a lot for some sort of project or something on... Uh, now, where was it? India, I think. No, uh, on China. Yes, yes. And it was an excellent piece of work. I saw it myself and was very impressed. And his art classes have also been going better this year. Yes, he became very interested in pop art after the school and went to the local art gallery to see the pictures there. His bedroom wall is covered with posters from the shop. Yes, and 58% is not bad for his exam result, considering how low it was last year. And now French. It seems that he has really taken to speaking a foreign language. We hoped he would, because it's important to know another language these days, isn't it? Yes, quite. That's why we paid for him to go to France last Easter, so he could practice more. Well, it seems to have done the trick. 80% is a very good mark. Now, Mrs Hargreaves, I'd just like to ask you one more thing about... That is the end of part one. 
You now have some time to check your answers. Turn to part two. Part two. You will hear a speech about staying safe at a holiday destination. First, you have some time to go through questions 11 to 14. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 14. Good evening, everyone. It's great to be here to talk to you about staying safe on holiday. Before I came this evening, I did a little research on where students like to go for their holidays and came up with two different regions, Latin America and India. So, um, I've been looking at the crime figures for both areas, and I thought I'd start by talking a bit about that. Then I'll give you some advice about how to avoid becoming a victim of crime. Okay, first of all, let's look at what kinds of crime are committed most in different regions. Um, okay, I'll start with India. Generally, India isn't thought of as a dangerous place for individuals, but there has been an increase in handbag theft in recent years. So keep an eye on your bag when you're out in the street. Right, now let's look at Latin America. Mm. Of course, you do realise that not all Latin American countries are the same, but it is true to say that guns are used in a high percentage of crimes across the region. Looking at the figures, it seems that gun crime is a serious problem throughout. Before you hear the rest of the speech, you have some time to go through questions 15 to 20. Now listen carefully and answer questions 15 to 20. I can see some of you are thinking that it all sounds rather dangerous, but I know lots of people who've been there and had a really great time. They followed advice from the authorities, like making sure they didn't wear expensive jewellery in the street. And I'd certainly advise anyone travelling to Latin America to do the same. Another thing you should be careful of is not to go to lonely places at night. But of course, that's the same anywhere. But I must say, you do have to be very careful in some parts of Latin America when you take your money out of a cash machine. Sometimes you find that thieves stand very close to people at cash machines and take their money as it comes out. Okay, so now I'll finish by talking a little bit about India. I've actually been to India, and I didn't have any feeling that it was dangerous at all. First of all, I went on an organised tour with a group of people. This is definitely the best way to go because it's so much safer. I mean, I didn't go anywhere without the group, and we had a tour guide who spoke the local language and knew the area. In fact, I remember now... She warned us not to go off with strangers, even if they seem nice and friendly. But again, you wouldn't do that at home either, would you? That is the end of part two. You now have some time to check your answers.
return to part 3. Part 3. You are going to hear an IT student, Sam, discussing his project with his tutor. First, you have some time to go through questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Hello, Sam. Come in and sit down. Thanks. You're here to discuss your company-based IT project, aren't you? Yes. I've been to see the manager and he's given me a lot of ideas about projects that the company would find useful. But I wanted to ask your opinion about them before I choose one. Yes, that's fine. Now, this company's called Turner's, isn't it? That's right. It's a small engineering company. They make machine components for trade use. They're well established. They started in 1976, but they're a bit old fashioned. OK. And what kind of projects did Turner's suggest you could do for the company? Well, they want some improvements made to their customer database. Uh, the one that they've got at the moment isn't very useful in some ways. I had a quick look at it. Uh, mm. That would be a very straightforward project, and it'd be simple enough to evaluate, but I don't think you'd get enough out of a project like that. You wouldn't learn anything new. Well, another project they suggested is to do with their online sales catalogue. At the moment, customers can look at their products, but they can't actually order them online, which m must affect their competitiveness. But I said I thought it would take too long. It's quite a big task. You're right. It's too much for the time you've got. It's a pity, though. Then they want some help with their payroll system. At the moment, the way they calculate pay involves a lot of manual accounting. I suggested they could have a system where employees register electronically when they arrive and leave work, so the hours they do could be transferred automatically. Hmm. I think you'd get a lot out of a project like that. It would extend your skills, but it wouldn't be too much to take on. A student did something similar a couple of years ago, but this is slightly different. Hmm. Well, then they need help with their stock inventory. They do everything manually. Really? <laughs> yes, and it takes so much time. Ugh. It's probably very inaccurate, too. An electronic inventory would probably be the biggest single benefit for the company. I'm surprised they haven't had it done before. Oh, I know. Then they wanted to improve their internal security. The manager had visited other companies where the staff use uh, swipe cards to access various areas of the building. It sounded useful, but the trouble is I'm not really sure how to do it. Well, I think you're right in that assessment. At the moment, it's probably a bit beyond your level of knowledge. Is that all? Just one more. Customer service. They want to be able to collect feedback from their customers in a more systematic way. At the moment, it's a bit of a mess, and they probably lose business as a result. Would that involve you going to see customers at their own premises? Because in that case, you might have to do a fair amount of traveling, and that would incur expenses that haven't been agreed with these companies. I never thought of that. Well, it might not be a problem, but it's something that needs clarifying. Well, I hope that's been helpful in narrowing down the options. Yes, it has. Thanks. I'll be able to make a decision now. But while I'm here, can I talk to you about coursework? Sure. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to go through questions 27 to 30.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 27 to 30. I'm not very happy about the way our group assignment is working. There are some problems. Oh dear. Are people just not getting on with each other? That's the worst thing. Actually, we're all friends. It's not that. But when we're having a discussion about the assignment, one or two people end up doing all the talking and the rest don't say anything. It's a bit frustrating because we need plenty of debate. Well, that's a common observation. You're studying in a group with people from all over the world and you all have your own ways of participating. In some places, students are more used to listening than talking and vice versa. Mm, I suppose you're right. I'll try to remember that. Does everyone pull their weight as far as sharing the workload is concerned? I'd say they do, yes. And our group elected uh, a leader. She's very good at making sure no one's overloaded. But personally, I feel that there are just too many of us in the group. Whenever we try to arrange a meeting, there's always at least one person who can't make it. It's not anyone's fault, it's just that we've all got slightly different timetables. Well, I'm glad you've talked to me about it. Feedback is always useful. Is there anything else you're concerned about? Uh, there are a couple of problems with lecturers that, that all the students are talking about. Hmm. Last semester we had negative feedback about the way lectures were organized. There were several occasions when the wrong room had been booked or the same room had been booked twice, that sort of thing. Is that still a problem? That hasn't happened at all as far as I know. Oh, good. It's sorted out then. But I don't know the reason, but some of the staff often turn up late, so we miss 10 or 15 minutes of our lecture time. It might be because they've been copying handouts for students. I think there's a queue for the machine sometimes. Well, I'll look into that. Thank you for telling me. Anything else? <laughs> the other thing is that it can be very difficult to get to see a lecturer individually. They're all very supportive and friendly when you do manage to find them, but often they're not in their office, even at times when they're meant to be available for consultation. Okay, that's helpful. Now, before you leave... Uh, let me... That is the end of part three. You now have some time to check your answers. Turn to part four. Part four. You will hear a part of a lecture given by a historian, about identifying the origin of handwritten books. First, you have some time to go through questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. My presentation today is on how the science of genetics is being used to shed light on the origin of manuscripts, anything written by hand, produced in the medieval period, that is, the period between the 5th and 15th centuries AD. As many of you know, thousands of medieval handwritten books still exist today. Some of them have a clear provenance, that is, we know exactly where and when they were written. But the origin of many manuscripts has been a complete mystery, that is, until 2009, when geneticists started using DNA testing to shed light on their origins. 
But before looking at the new research, I need to explain something about the way the manuscripts were produced, particularly what they were written on. Virtually all were written on treated animal skins, and there were essentially two types. The first was parchment, which is made of sheepskin. It has the quality of being very white, but also being thin. It has a naturally greasy surface, which meant it was hard to erase writing from it. This made it much sought after for court documents in medieval times. The second type is vellum, which is calfskin. This was most often used for any very high-status documents because it provided the best writing surface, so scribes could achieve lettering of high quality. So, once the animal hides had been chosen, they had to be prepared. Where the right materials were on hand, the skins were put into large barrels or vats of lime, where they were agitated or stirred frequently. But if lime wasn't available, then the hides were buried. Both these techniques were designed to cause the hair to slough off and the skins to become gelatinous and therefore more flexible. The next stage was to put the hides on stretcher frames and pull them very tight. While on the frame, they were scraped with a moon-shaped knife in order to create a uniform thickness. For parchment, that was the end of the process. But for vellum, there was an additional stage where it was bleached in order to achieve the desired color. So, what does all this preparation mean for the quest to identify the origins of mystery manuscripts? Well, until recently, the only way historians and other academics were able to guess at origins was either through the analysis of the handwriting style or from the dialect in which the piece was written. But these techniques have proven unreliable for a number of reasons. It was thus decided to try to look at the problem from a different angle, to start from what is known, that is, the small number of manuscripts whose origins we do already know. Because these parchments and vellum are both made from animal hides, it was possible to subject them to DNA testing and to identify the genetic markers for the date and location of production. From this was created what is known as a baseline. The next stage was to test the mystery manuscripts, finding their DNA characteristics, and then making comparisons between the known and the mystery scripts. Genetic similarities and differences enabled the scientists to gain more information about the origins of the many manuscripts we had known virtually nothing about up to that point. Now you might ask, what are the potential uses of this new information? Well, obviously, it can shed light on the origin of individual books and manuscripts. But that's not all. It can also shed light on the evolution of the whole of the manuscript production industry in medieval times. And because that was such a thriving business, involving very large-scale movements right across the globe, the new data in turn help historians establish which trade routes were in operation during the whole millennium. Now, if anyone has any questions... That is the end of part four. If you found this test useful, then please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to us at Top Isles Tests.